welcome friends to this afternoon after lunch session of our monthly meetings. When I come into these meetings, you might notice I greet you. I greet because I know that we are all the same. We greet our creator in each other. If we realize that part, we would not be against anybody. We are all made by the same creator. He is in each one of us. These differences that we notice are just for the show, for the act. We are all actors on the stage and we see the differences. Today, now when I came in the afternoon, I saw a lot of happiness on your faces, which gives me the inference that the lunch was good. <laughs> and you must have enjoyed it. Happiness comes from inside. The, when you are in love, you are always happy. When you are in true love, with a true personification of love, that is a perfect living master whose consciousness and the level of totality of love, you're always happy. You want to experience happiness at all times, 24-7, 365, 366 days in the year, just experience love at all times. It is not easily possible to do that with people because a lot of time, some kind of infatuation, some attraction, some attachments are mistaken to be love. And they break up. I get so many visits from young people, young couples, telling me we are made for each other. We found our soulmates, we are soulmates. And we know we are identical in souls. And you bless us now. We want to get married. And I say I bless you. And may God bless you and may you have a happy married life. After three months, they come back to me. We are in the divorce court and we are separating. And I said, what happened? From day one, we knew we are not made for each other. I said, that is not what you said to me on day one. So when we say we love people, it may not be true love. There's one big distinction between what we call love and what is true love. When we say, I love you, it's not true love. Because I is ahead of you. Not only in words, in feelings, in attitude. You are conscious of I. I am doing something. Maybe good for you, good for me. I love you. Ego game. It's not love. What happens in true love? You forget I. You don't even know who I is. You matters. You is the only thing. The beloved replaces the lover in true love. And you can't even think of yourself. You can think of the beloved all the time. It's you, 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 and that's love. But not when I am the prominent part. Now that kind of experience where only you remains, you don't get ordinarily. You can get sometimes. If you do get that experience sometimes with people of true love, you can't sustain it because you are dependent for all your experiences on your mind. And the mind thinks. And when the mind thinks, it creates doubt. And doubt leads to fear. So you even have doubt about your true love. And that's amazing how the mind works. You can have an experience of true love and feel so beautiful and wonderful about it. And after some time, I'm not sure if she loves me also or he loves me also. A doubt comes up in the mind. This mechanism installed in us, in our consciousness. I call it mechanism. People don't think it's mechanism, but it's I call the mind, the mental activity as a mechanism to do something. It's a very great device. It's one of the greatest devices I have seen, better than any computer, any other invented device of a human being. The human mind is the best device because it can create an experience of time, space. It can create experience of past and future and present. Did you know, if the mind were not there, there would be no past, no present, no future. Human mind. How does the human mind create past, present and future? It creates past by memory. You remember something happened a minute ago. 
yesterday, day before yesterday. Supposing you didn't remember, there's no past. And how do you remember? With the mind. What about the present? There is no present in time. The moment I start using the word present, it's past already. Before I said it's the future. Present is a totally timeless link between the past and the future. Therefore, there's no time in present. Never was. What we call present, I am talking to you in the present, is talking about immediate past. The last few seconds, last few minutes I have talked, I say I am talking in the present. It's all memory. Memory of the last few minutes that I am calling present. So the mind is creating this concept through memory of past and present. What about future? Does that exist? Somewhere hidden up? No, the mind creates that too. How does the mind create a future? By hoping for things to come. Fearing that that may come. Anticipating something may happen. Supposing these three words, hope, fear and anticipation, were removed from our language, from every language, there will be no future. Ever thought of it? That the future is being created by this mental activity? How much power does the mind have to create our whole sense of time? It's not being created by anybody else. We say, in Indian literature I found, they mentioned the negative power called Kal does it. In America, I came, they said Cal, but it doesn't matter, it's just an <laughs> accent. That Cal is the negative power we are fighting. Cal is doing everything. What is Cal? What is Kal? Do you know what it means, the word? Translate it. It's a Indian, Indian word translated to English. English translation is time. Kal is time, nothing else. Created by the mind. How can the mind create that power? Because Kal represents itself in the human being through the mind. They know the Kal. The mind is the Kal. And creates the experience of time. In such a beautiful way. We take it as real. Time is the greatest reality for us. We can't get rid of it. We talk of a timeless state in our true home. And we say, when was that? In the beginning this happened. There was no beginning. We say, when we left our true home, when did we leave? There was no time. We use all these phrases. We are confined to time. We are imprisoned by time. Therefore, call is a very strong power. Time is a very strong power created by our mind through the process of creating a past through memory and a present by feeling the recent memory is present and a future creating by our hoping, fearing and anticipating. Look at this. Examine it carefully. There's no time. We create it. Why do we create it? In order to put events of our life in a line of time frame. Just to put the events. This happened earlier. This is going to happen. This is happening now. What is the recent past? By putting it like this, we are really getting into real trouble because then we introduce a new law. The law that has imprisoned us more than even time. Time we can't see. We take it for granted it is there. But the new law is the law of karma. The law of cause and effect. Which cannot exist without time. Which cannot exist without space. Time and space are by the way the same thing. We didn't know that time and space could be the same thing. Because when you say now and then. You are creating time. When you say here and there, you create creating space. Both require time. You can't have space without time. And you can't have time without time. So time is the real master of our experiences. When we want to create events of life, which we are creating all the time. When we want to create events of life, we place them on a line of a created space-time and put them at different places. Then, through memory, we go through them, one by one. If you examine this proposition carefully, you will notice that it is all a game of memory. Memory has created the past. Memory has created the present. Memory is creating the future. Because even to hope, to fear, to anticipate requires time and that's memory. Supposing you built up a series of events, made a little capsule, a little cartridge, like a computer chip, and put whole life's events into the chip. 
and installed in your consciousness and open it up, your life will be led here. This is precisely what we are doing. This is exactly how life is being created and we have a very large selection. We have made all kinds of infinite varieties of these capsules or DVDs, whatever like you call them, and we play them and we live real life. We think it's real life. Where is this installation taking place? Where do we install these capsules of memory that create life and destiny? At the causal plane, the mental plane, where the mind works. Where do we design these? Where do we design these capsules and DVDs and make a variety of them available to us above the mind in a place called Parbrahm, beyond the created universe, three universes, where for the first time we realize that the soul or unit of consciousness is independent and it is just part of the total. There, in order to have experience, we generate an infinite number of these. Then we get into the mental realm and have picked up one of them. True use of free will. The soul has freedom that no other power has. True use of free will to pick up the first capsule. Now, there is a wonderful system that the capsule itself requires the events be connected to each other by cause and effect. That's how law of karma works. As you sow, so shall you reap. You do good things, you will be rewarded. Do bad things, you will be punished. The whole law of karma is based on that. Therefore, when you want to do good things and get a good result, it has to be done prior to getting the result. Now, it will look very silly for me to say that the result was made first, the cause was made afterwards. The cause has to come first in the law of time itself. Cause and effect means cause precedes effect. So, when we are born as a human being and born sick, born blind, born with deformity, when did we have a chance to do something, create a cause for that? Therefore, the law of cause and effect itself requires that when you have one life, there has to be a previous life to get it. So you pick up a capsule or a DVD of one life in the causal plane, install in consciousness and you start living the astral and the physical life. And when you are here, you have lived no life to create that. But the capsule contains the memory of a past life. So your, your past life becomes your past life. Can you imagine that you had nothing to do with it? But you created a sequence of not one past life. That past life must depend on another past life. Therefore, you create infinite past lives just to have one life. And one life gives you the freedom of experience of free will. Therefore, you know you are doing good or bad. A unique feature of human life. So when you do good or bad, it must go on to consequences and you die before the consequences, there has to be a future life. So where there is no future life, you are creating future life. That will create another one, infinite number of future lives. Can you imagine the setup? How we are set up like this? There is no real karma at all. The soul has no karma whatsoever. It's part of the show here. And we created the karma through the process of time. That is why we think call is a great negative power. Time is a great negative power. So we create time, we create past, present and future, we create karma and then we create unlimited karma. Endless. But once we are here and we have decided not to go back after one life, then the second life becomes a reality for us. Then all subsequent lives become a reality for us and we are trapped in the law of karma. What a what a strange trap. Thank God there is a way to get out. Otherwise, this trap is so endless, you could never get out. This trap that is laid out through karma, that you do the best good actions, give charity, do prayers, do meditation, worship, and you come back to get rewards for all that. You don't escape. You do all the bad things in the world, you come back to be punished for that. It's a very big trap. There is no greater trap than the trap of time in which karma operates. And that is why, can anybody get out of it? 
there have been yogis, rishis, maharishis, great saints who have come and told us to go to a better place, who've told us that you can go to heaven. There are so many heavens existing in the astral plane. You can go to heaven. You can see God sitting there. You can sit next to God. If you can see God, you see the person, his being. No matter what kind of being he is, his being separates from you. It's not your totality. It's not your true home. All these talks about heaven are created universes like ours. You go to a nice place, have a good time there, and the time is over, it's based upon your good actions here, you come back, carry on. No escape. You can neither escape by prayer, nor by good deeds, nor by any good action. You still go around in circles in this law of karma. Because it's all within the mind. It's all operating within the mind. To go beyond the mind, a rare event. But it happens. To go beyond the mind, you must be pulled out from this almost unbreakable wall. You have to be pulled out of it by something that pulls you, not that you can push through. You can't push through this wall. Because all pushing is done by your mind. You can't push in any event, in any way, except through your mind. The mind thinks how to do it. The mind tries to push and cannot push through. Only love from the other side can pull you. And that's what happens. When you come across this perfect living master who is operating from beyond the mind. Not that he has reached beyond the mind and has come back to tell you. He's not giving a discourse on what happens. He is operating in a human body while we are watching him living an ordinary life. He is operating from his consciousness beyond the mind. And that true love from beyond the mind is pulling you to beyond the mind. Only love and devotion can take you beyond the mind, which is not on your effort at all. All effort is mental, no matter how you do it. Effort is not the method. It is this effortlessness of experiencing love, unconditional love, and being pulled by it. A friend of mine once wrote to me from Cambridge, from university where I studied with him. He says, I have after many years discovered that effort is no use in this spiritual path. It's an effortless path. At the end, he writes, now I'm going to try very hard for the effortless part. <laughs> That's the mind. You can imagine the mind contradicting itself immediately after such a good discourse he's giving in his letter. It's the pull of the love that comes. It's not in your control. Or is it? I say it's not in your control. I'm talking to you as human beings. It's entirely in your control when I talk to you as your true self. Because you set it up. The perfect living master is nobody else than your own true self appearing as a human being in this life. He's your own true self. There are no two true selves. There's only one. He appears when you are ready. And he pulls you by that love because you arrange it. You are pulling yourself. It looks like somebody else is doing it. It's just an apparent experience here. Go in and find out what the truth is. All these things I say, verify. They are inside each one of us. No difference at all. Don't think that a perfect living master is some way superior to you in the assets we have in our head. We all are the same. No difference. You are all perfect living masters if you, reach, if you just waken up to the consciousness. It's already sitting in you. It's not something he put into your head. A perfect living master does not come to give you something extra in your consciousness or in your head. You already got it. He awakens you to it by means appropriate to the experience you are having at that time. Since we are having a human experience in the physical world, he appears as a human being, tells us, meditate, do this, do that. Be careful of a diet, do this. Now, do you mean to say that by taking a particular kind of diet, one can get enlightened? Has it ever happened? I went to a conference in Japan once where Zen Buddhists invited me and they said that they have found a particular kind of rice. And that rice has got all the spirituality. They take that rice and get enlightened. I ate so much of that rice, nothing happened. I, I can't believe that taking a particular kind of variety of rice 
I was a member of the rice board of the country, and I attended 258 kinds of rice I saw, and none of them had that property. I don't know any food in the world that by consuming food or taking a pill, you can get enlightened. I was at Harvard University, and two professors tried to get enlightenment by taking Mexican mushrooms. Later on, they took them out. Professor Richard Alpert, who became Ram Das later on, Baba Ram Das, and Timothy Leary, who was expelled. Both of them were expelled from the university for those experiments. They set up a yoga center where they tried to get experiences. They were great experiences. No enlightenment at all. So you can't get enlightened by taking food or drugs or anything inside. You can get experiences which are erratic. Sometimes they can be terrible. Sometimes they can be damaging. So those experiences don't mean enlightenment. Enlightenment comes when you discover this body is not you, the senses are not you, the mind is not you. You are the conscious power that's making these work. Then you realize who you are. You are consciousness which makes all this work. So that is why it is necessary to remember that our effort is done for the sake of our mind. We have been indoctrinated that nothing can be obtained by us in this world or anywhere else without our effort. That without struggle you get nothing. The mind has been convinced about it. So we think we have to work hard even on the spiritual path. Yes, you have to work hard in order to see it fails. I'm telling you the truth. You can work very hard and it fails. You can meditate very hard and it fails. It's not a lesson of the failure of meditation. It's a lesson that meditation is not the way ultimately. But you will not accept it till you fail. When you fail, they say, there's something else. And if you're being guided by a perfect living master, he'll tell you, now, next phase, develop more love and devotion. I have sometimes told the story of a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, who was initiated by the same master that I was. Hazur Maharaj Baba Sawan Singh, great master. He was his disciple, I was also his disciple. Great master passed away, his physical body died, his next successor died, another successor died. Then many masters came up, all claiming to be following the line. Many lineages started off. All of us said, we are the true masters. So nobody knew who the true master is. I know the great master, the true master. I don't comment upon anybody else. All the lineages coming. Many of the masters knew this friend of mine, whose name was, now he's passed away, I can tell you the name, Hira Singh. And he had a foundry and a house. And all the masters, including great master, had visited this house. And given this course, he had a big house. And a big yard, courtyard outside where he would have some, many people could sit. They would put tents and so on. One of the masters was giving a discourse and I happened to be there with an American friend of mine who was also here, I guess. And the master dropped his satsang, finished, and he says, I said, finish your satsang. We both have brought an American friend with me. And he said, finish, satsang finished. So we went in. And this uh, Hira Singh, my friend, was watching. And some people asked me some questions. I was answering questions in a very simple way like I've always done. Hira Singh says to me afterwards, I want to ask you a question. I said, what is it? He said, you and I are disciples of the same master. And we have been initiated and we have been meditating for 40 years now. 40, 40. And you seem to have got something out of it. And I have got nothing. How come? I have had no inner experience. I have meditated regularly. Two and a half hours as was prescribed. I followed the diet. I led a very moral life. I have been very careful. I got nothing. I followed very rigidly the discipline. And you seem to have got something. And I'm not sure of what kind of life you led. Maybe not as rigid as mine. But I said, what makes you think that I have got something better than you? He said, the way you answer questions. I want to know why this discrimination. I said, you know, I want to tell you a secret. When I give answers to questions, I don't really answer them. 
It's my master. I check with my master. Whatever answer he gives, I tell them. People think I know it. Actually, it is my master's knowledge that I'm sharing, not my own. So therefore, don't be mistaken. He says, I can't do that. I said, your question that why did you not get this ability to get master's answers inside you? I have to check with my master again. He said, okay, go check and tell me. He doesn't, master not always available to answer all the questions. We have to get time from him. He said, how much time do you need? I said, this difficult question will take about six months. Of course, I said, I'm on the side, I'm telling you, I said this because I was coming back to the United States. <laughs> so, the next trip was only after six months. I, after six months, I visited him again. I said, got the answer for you. Great master's answer is that in your meditation, you missed out one element. An element he has been telling you because you told me then he said this question, I had asked him earlier, that why didn't you ask the masters who are coming to your house? He said, I did ask great master, I'm making no progress. He said, do your meditation with love and devotion. I asked other masters, they smiled and said the same thing. I said, the master's answer now is the same. What was missing in your meditation was you treated it as a mechanical exercise, not love and devotion. You thought it is your obstinacy, your Hut your ability to sit for long periods. You're just building up your ego. And where is love and devotion in that? In love and devotion, you think nothing of master. I said, you should do meditation. Talk to your master. Tell him whatever feelings you have about him. Complain to him. Cry to him. Criticize him. Blame him. But talk to him. Have you done that? I said, no, i never done that. That's the missing point. Now try. After 40 years, you can still learn to do this. Meditation should not be a routine thing that you just repeat words and follow a diet and you're getting enlightened. Nobody has got like that. By repeating words, by eating a particular diet, you get nothing. You get ego only. I have done so much. Therefore, try this. My next visit was again after six months. I went and saw him. He said I got more in this six months than in 40 years. I made inner progress and my outer life has changed. So this is the whole element. If we learn that the secret of spiritual success is love and devotion and the rest is for the mind. The rest is for our mind already trained, already, already told, indoctrinated almost with the idea you have to do something to get something. Therefore, master say, yes, do it. And they put rigid restrictions on you. I told him, I am a vegetarian. I don't take meat for various reasons which have been explained. But the main reason is, my master said this. If I can't do that, what my master wants, what kind of uh, love and devotion do I have? If I can't do a simple thing that he has just expressed his wish that I do, if I can't even do that, it's not the di diet. It's whether I am in that love with my master to carry out. Today we fall in love with a simple person, human being, and we are willing to do anything for that person. And we say we are in love with God, we are in love with the master, and we can't do a simple thing if he says. It's a minor, very minor thing. People do major things when they are in love. So that's the secret. That you are not doing it, doing these things. You are making your mind do these things in order to show that love is superior to all these mental activities here. He made good progress. So I am just highlighting this point that meditation and all these instructions are for our current state of mind, our current state in which we live and believe in. We have been believing in these things that our struggle can only give us things. Struggle will not give us things, but we can't say, now I'm going to give up struggle. That's also struggle. To give up struggle is the greatest struggle. Try that. If you say, I am going to put no effort, next day you will be putting effort. People tell me about an experience I had, which I shared with people. I shouldn't have, I believe. I shared a deal I had with my master when I was young. And the deal was based upon a discourse he gave, in which he said, it was on a verse taken from a holy book, which was read out and then he gave an explanation. 
the verse said i'll translate for you kaya nagar nagar hai nicho vich sauda har ras kije it really means the whole poem meant that this body of ours is like a city like a town in the town there's a market place up in the head if you want to have a real deal go to that market place and get it so after hearing that i went to my master i said master are real deals taking place where you sit inside after initiating me are real deals taking place there he said yes i said as so far as i know a deal means i give you something and you give me that something he said that's correct i okay i want to have a deal i want to give you all my worries all my problems all the difficulties i will come across in life you give me all the happiness give me all the joy and you know what he said done <laughs> whether you believe it or not he has kept his word from that day and i have kept mine i shouldn't have told this most secret deal but i told it i told it to my first american friends when i came in 1963 to this country to live here and satsangis followers of masters criticized me they ridiculed me criticized me and said what an unfair thing you did to your master what a bad thing to do to turn over your problems and difficulties to the old man and then you get all the happiness from him very unfair deal it's not like a satsangi at all and i was shocked i said this is the greatest deal i ever got <laughs> and they are criticizing me that i was unfair they did not know that unfairness does not exist in our home town in our true home unfairness exists only in the mind unfairness exists here good and bad exists here they don't exist where we belong and the master it does not operate from here he operates from the true home the problem was not that the deal was bad deal was very good and i can verify i have entered the 90th year of my life today when you are 90 years old you have some experience behind you in the physical world and it doesn't mean that the the deal was long ago the secret is that the deal anybody can have master will keep his word you will not be able to keep it people say we want to have a deal we give all the worries and next day they start worrying why did we i don't want to worry about it but i'm worrying the deal is off so you can't have a deal when you can't keep your word it requires something very different than merely words to have a deal like that it requires an ability to control your mind not go by its advice but go by intuitive experiences that you get from the master and there are always methods by which master tells you all the time what is supposed to be done not only a gut feeling internal and external experiences all tell you what to do a deal can be done but then it's all based upon love and devotion not on the mind not on mental stuff i share these experiences toward the last part of my life so that if is any benefit to you please take advantage you are very blessed first of all you are very blessed to be human beings secondly you are very blessed to be seekers and i assure you if you are seekers you are going to find and it's guaranteed that you will find if you are seekers of the ultimate if you are seeking worldly things then you will get worldly things but not go to your true home if you are seeking mental things you get mental things but not go to your true home if you are thinking of your true home beyond the mind beyond the three worlds of the mind not connected with these things you will go there definitely thank you very much for very patient listening to me